Welcome to the Space Shovel podcast. So this is Avian's innovation podcast where we talk about things that are going on in the world uh, related to mostly technology, some uh, innovations in different ways. But I have Dan and Tyler with me today. Dan is our VP for gross, that's not correct, VP for innovation. And there's more to that, but I can't remember it. Strategic? Strategic innovation. Strategic innovation. VP okay. for strategic innovation. VP for strategic innovation. And Tyler, I don't know your exact title, but this is a good opportunity for you to explain that and give <laughs> some background into what you do for the company. Yes. Yeah, so uh, right now I'm directly supporting a government customer as an operations manager for uh, CUAS, so okay. counter on main systems. Gotcha. Cool. And your background, because of the topic of this episode, yeah. you've worked with LiDAR before, high-end LiDAR, um, which makes you the perfect guy to talk to some of the things yep. that we're talking about today. Dan, this will be the one and only time that you need to explain your background, but go ahead and give us a little introduction about um, both what you do for the company and maybe a little bit of a, about your background. I know it, it's quite extensive. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Ian. That's twice in the last five minutes you've called me old using different ways experience. of actually <laughs> saying say old. Experience. Experience. One, old. you've been around a long time, but two, have you gotten your COVID vaccine yet? Um, no, I appreciate that. So for, for the company, one of my primary duties is uh, vice president of strategic innovations, and that is Finding essentially, it's finding new ways and new places for the company to uh, grow the business. Uh, primarily, Avian being um, a, a defense services company. Uh, primarily with the Naval Air Systems Command. Well, what else is out there? Well, it's a big world. Uh, what can we do to find new opportunities uh, for for company growth? Things that are interesting and sort of outside the mainstream of what we've been doing. Uh, prior to that, 34-year uh, career as a civil servant, uh, with my last gig being in the Pentagon. Uh, I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Air and Ground Programs. Uh, pretty interesting job. Saw a lot of stuff. Got to experience a lot of things. Uh, in that job, I got to uh, meet a lot of interesting people, uh, make a lot of connections, so it was pretty cool. Uh, before that, uh, worked at Nav Air, uh, head of the cost department. Uh, and before that, head of the Aviation Readiness and Resources Group. And if you go far enough back in my career, somewhere you can find that I was an aerospace engineer. So he should have had his COVID shot by now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. I didn't actually know that you were an aerospace engineer, so that's cool to learn today. Yeah. Um, University of Michigan, at the time, number two aerospace engineering school in the oh, country. Who was number one? MIT. Oh, that, that, <laughs> they, that makes sense. They, 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 yeah, they do some pretty good stuff there. All right, so let's talk about LiDAR. Um, this episode, we are talking about specifically uh, the LiDAR that's in a lot of people's pockets now in the Apple phone. Um, very different than the high-end LiDAR that Tyler has worked with in the past, uh, but I think there would be some cool differences there. Where do you want to start with this? So I know a little bit of information about this. It's it's um, basically LiDAR and Tyler, you may know the history more than I do, but LiDAR is a pretty old technology. It was invented around the same time as lasers. Um, it's just becoming more prevalent, cheaper probably to manufacture now. Um, and we're seeing it because Apple is, is putting it in their devices for um, different augmented reality applications and um, some measurement and accuracy tools. Yeah, it's not a new technology. No. It's been used, especially in the surveying and mapping world. Uh, LiDAR has been used uh, for years. Yeah. Um, I was introduced to it when the technology itself was small enough and cheap enough and light enough, to be honest with you, to put on a, a drone yep. or a commercial off-the-shelf aircraft, right? So um, that's when I was introduced to it. But if you actually look back to how they utilize LiDAR, Previously, they were putting these on manned aircraft. Mm -hmm. um, they were very expensive. So you're talking, you know, lasers that were $500,000 plus, and that's a, that's a cheap manned right. uh, LiDAR right. sensor. Um, so um, they were being put on, on these manned aircraft uh, as a remote sensing. And then you also, they were being put on uh, vehicles as well. You, there's mm -hmm. uh, companies out there like Trimble, Leica, um, and they've got these mobile mappers. That's the big thing. So... If you think about uh, Google and Google Earth and Google Maps, yeah. that technology was really developed and uh, with LiDAR along with some uh, remote sensing with images, actual imagery. But um, 
it's just now come to the point where that technology has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller and right. smaller and cheaper, right? So, um, but it's it's nothing new. Um, it's just gotten less complicated to handle the data and uh, cheaper and smaller that almost, you know, it's now affordable in everybody's home. Yeah, so the way that Apple uses the technology is kind of interesting. So they they have these data points, which LiDAR is basically putting points in a for lack of better terms, like a graphical representation. Um, it then uses some of the other sensors that are in the actual phone or, at, or iPad um, to make sure that those points are accurate. So it's not just using the LiDAR sensor, it's using the camera, and um, there are a few other sensors built into the devices to then make sure that it's basically double checking its work, um, all happening while you're using the application. So that's cool. Um, a lot of people are using it to map like the inside of their houses or just like objects that they have on the ground. Um, the work that Tyler did was a lot more complicated than that. I've seen full dams be mapped with LiDAR. Um, I couldn't find how many data points there were in the Apple devices, like data points per whatever, I forget what the measurement is. Um, but I saw on, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, we used, um, or we, have used in the past the Phoenix LiDAR system? Is that Yeah, right? so we had the Phoenix LiDAR system. Um, so really, when for the, the systems that are out there that uh, we utilized is you have a, a sensor that's created by Regal. And Regal creates the sensor. Okay. And so they, they actually have the laser and all of that. What happens is, is you have other companies that have taken that sensor and integrated all that extra stuff you need to make sure that the accuracy is there right. and the software, how you gather that data is there. Um, so there's a, an IMU, which essentially uh, gets integrated into that sensor that allows that sensor to know its pitch, yaw, and roll when it mm -hmm. took its measurements. So when that information comes back, that IMU has to be accurate Calibrates as well, that, all that calibration. Otherwise, your, your data is going to be corrupt or it's going to be off right. uh, when you get that. So what Phoenix does is Phoenix takes the sensor from Regal, which is one of the highest end uh, sensors, at least for unmanned systems right now, and they integrate an IMU. And you can you can actually pay for different IMUs. You can get a, an upgraded IMU oh, or a downgraded sure. IMU, um, depending on what, what your pocketbook's willing right. to, to put and out how, there, right? And how accurate you want to be. And how accurate your data needs to be, really, and, and what you're trying <laughs> to achieve within your goals. Because sometimes you don't need the the sub centimeter accuracy within your data and you know a, a couple centimeters is good or or you know a, a foot is good in some cases right, right? so right. it really kind of depends what you're going after um so phoenix takes all of that information puts it into um kind of a, a one-stop shop and they have the software and everything to be able to collect that data from so that's what we were utilizing was that phoenix suite right. Um, of the system overall. Yeah, and like I said, the, the data maps that I've seen from, yeah. from that system are impressive. It almost looks like a painting of, of a landscape or a, whatever you're mapping at the time. Um, so that's a lot about the yeah. basics of LiDAR. Right. Um, I don't want to focus too much on that. What types of like, so I want to jump into limitations and also maybe like use cases for for the phone and then how that compares to use cases for like the high end stuff. So which one would you like to go well, let, for? Well, let's first? jump into the phone because what's the title of the podcast? So there's a lighter in your pocket. Lighter in your pocket. pocket. Yep. Right. So <laughs> in, in in I guess my perspective is it's it's cool that they put this into the iPhone. Uh but we're still just scratching the surface of what it could turn into because right yeah. now it's mostly used uh, for people that want to, like you said, Ian, uh, take a 3D rendering of their house and see what the chair looks like in the corner, right? right? And, and augmented reality. Or gamers are using it for stuff that I don't understand. But it's the same <laughs> kind of thing. It's augmented reality for the gaming system. In my mind, there are a ton mm -hmm. of other things where this is going to end up. One thing that came to mind is, is let's call it crowdsourcing of, I don't know, everything. So let's say that... Google or probably Apple or somebody ends up creating an app where you could put your phone like on your your jacket as you're walking down Fifth Avenue. Mm -hmm. And then it automatically uploads Fifth Avenue in New York City up 
to a cloud. And let's say 20 people do that. There's some type of AI that sorts through everything. And suddenly you now have a near perfect 3D reality of Fifth Avenue. And now let's say somebody else goes, hey, I think I'd like to take my Peloton down Fifth Avenue. <laughs> and you suddenly can take your Peloton down Fifth Avenue and you're in that virtual world. And eventually you can see it being Fifth Avenue, Park Avenue, the East River, the Hudson River, Chicago, LA. And in my mind, I see like a bad pun, virus spreading yes. <laughs> uh, across the country. And you could see that this crowdsourced 3D augmented reality, virtual reality of, I don't know, everywhere. Right. That yeah. you could be, you could then tap into. And then once you have that sort of baseline of augmented reality everywhere, you could use it for a lot of different things. You could use it for architecture. You could use it for finding things that aren't there that used to be there. Or if you're looking for something, you could see, hey, it used to look like this. Now it looks like that. And maybe they use it for search and rescue. I don't know if somebody, let's say you're doing the Appalachian Trail. You yeah. know, somebody's going to walk the length of the App Appalachian Trail with the with the lighter on their jacket, and you have the entirety of the Appalachian Trail, I don't know, maybe use it for environmental purposes. I don't know. In my mind, once people get a hold of this and start using it in small spaces and it gets crowdsourced, it's going to be a little bit scary, at least to this old guy. Well, the, the big thing I to kind of play off of that is the accuracy that LiDAR gives in the data. Yeah. So when you talk about that, that crowdsourcing, so you can go on Google Earth right now, right, or Google Maps, and you can do that like street view, which right. kind of gives you, and they're utilizing that with, with images right now. But if you're able to now have essentially a pretty accurate with within a, a couple inches of uh, measurements, so now uh, when you talk about architecture or just the accuracy of trails themselves, themselves, like you talked about the Appalachian Trail. You can measure now distances. If you're trying to put a, I don't know, it, 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 when we come to free funded sources like Google, if I'm trying to plan my kid's birthday in the park and I want to know, can that jumpy castle fit? Right, right. I can now actually go in and take measurements, uh, like the measurement tool on Google Earth, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And you can zoom all the way in, and now you can get pretty accurate measurements of smaller spaces. Hey, Space Shovel Watchers. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If you have an extra second, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button. Stay up to date on the Work Awesome Network on everything that's going on. If you want to learn more about the company behind the Work Awesome Network and behind the Space Shovel podcast, jump over to avian.com, A-V-I-A-N.com to learn about the company, to learn about the work that we do, and, and just to get a little bit more background information on the type of company that we are. Again, thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If if you want to stay up to date on everything going on in the Work Awesome Network, please jump over to any social media site that you consume content on, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. We're basically on all of them under Work Awesome Network. That's the place to get the latest updates, the latest blog posts, the latest information on everything going on Work Awesome related. Now back to this episode uh, to be able to make those yeah, type I'll, of decisions. Yeah, I'll drop another one on you and I'll maybe even bet a dollar that five years from now, when you go to the doctor, they're going to do a LIDAR scan of you and, like, say, your teeth, right? And so that if ever something goes tragically wrong and they, they need to lop off a limb from you, you now have this 3D model that they could theoretically 3D print you a limb that was just like the limb that you had when they took that model of you. With the, you know, the doctor pulls out his iPhone and says, hold still for a minute, and he goes around you. <laughs> Okay, you're good. We got you. And, right. and then you're in the database. You know, there's all sorts of crazy stuff, crazy to me, all sorts of stuff that can happen once you have a virtual or augmented reality of the real thing. Yeah. And beyond just a room and does a flower chair look good in the corner? Right. As we mentioned earlier, this <clears throat> technology is not new. So it's already being utilized. But what you're doing is it's now cheap enough and small enough that you're giving it to every user. So, for example, like in a building, uh, when we think about 
if I wanted to scan an office space for architectural or design purposes, there's a way of doing that. So, and even on construction sites, there's a way of doing that. They call it TLS, which is uh, terrestrial laser scanning. So they, but these systems, uh, TLS scanners from, you know, whether it's the Faro system or a Trimble system or a Topcon system, they're expensive. They're, you're talking in the $50,000 plus range right. and, and 50,000 is a pretty low number for, for one of those systems. But now you're able to give somebody that tool for a thousand bucks. And now everybody has that tool to be able to, to have those qu quick decisions. Yeah. Um, the thing that came up into mind, and I know TLS is being utilized heavily in this area already, but it's now you're, you're, you could essentially give it to every detective or investigator is crime scene um, recreation, crime accident recreation. So what happens right now is when they have a, a major accident on a highway where somebody normally ends up losing their life, they have to do it for court purposes and, and yeah. everything else. They have to do an accident scene recreation. And so some departments have the ability to have a TLS scanner or something like that to be able to bring out, to scan the area. So now they have that 3D model. But now you can do it. Now it's like three dudes with their phones. Correct. Like going out circle. and doing that. And if you think about just the court system, when you can now, you have a, a and I go gruesome, but you have a murder scene, right? Mm -hmm. And now you can essentially bring that murder scene up and have accurate measurements. Here and, it is. And bring that in a three-dimensional way into a courtroom. It's, it's right. so, absolutely incredible. So, so Tyler, that's, a, that's another great one. So you follow the chronology, right? 20 years ago, maybe 25, they had a person with a camera that had film in it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And they got to then develop the pictures from the film. Then it was a person with the camera and it was digital and they could take significantly more pictures and they were more accurate, et cetera. Correct. And then now they probably video them. But what you're saying is they would create the, the 3D, three D three dimensional virtual reality of that scene and then probably the next step is once they have that, they can maybe play it backwards and show what actually happened. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, going forward. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. All right, write that one down. Yeah. Uh, selling LIDAR to police departments. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there's a lot to unpack in what you just said. Um, there's the, the, the LIDAR, obviously, but there's augmented reality. There's machine learning to stitch all from the from the Fifth Avenue example to yeah. stitch all those pieces together. Someone writes a program, stitches it all together with machine learning. You'll have a perfect picture eventually. Um, and the eventually won't take that long. No, yeah. not at all. Uh, there were other points that I can't remember now, but there was a ton. Um, the other use case for that Fifth Avenue example, video games. People are using these um, LiDAR scans as 3D models to put into video games. So now you think about the, I don't know, Dan, if you know this one, uh, Grand Theft Auto. Yes, um, <laughs> thank you. Where you're, where you're trying to make realistic uh, scenes and cities, they, they can literally make New York City the way that it is supposed to look. Uh, so there's definitely... A and continually update it, yes. right? So that's so the key as right the there. Person, as yep. the next person is walking down the street and somebody begins construction on building X, yep. and then two weeks later or a day later, whenever the next person goes up, and you can actually watch the construction of that building. So if, if I'm on my non-existent Peloton and I'm going through on the 1st of April and I'm going down Fifth Avenue, and then I'm on my non-existent Peloton three months later and suddenly there's a new building or a refurbished building, well, it's updated because it's updated daily. Right. And then I also want to circle back to the crime scene one. Now I'm thinking, what if LIDAR is on every single vehicle on the road and it's well, cons constantly it, it, running? It already is because LIDAR is the basis driverless, for self-driving cars. Yes, driverless yep. cars. So, so that say that happens, well, the LIDAR on the vehicles are constantly running, you get an accurate representation of the accident in real time because you have so many crowdsourced images running at the Here's same time. Here's what actually happened. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, the, the key is, is the, the continuous update because they're already putting mobile LIDARs, but those are expensive and it's going to run through once, maybe every five years. Right. Uh, that's my biggest problem right now with 
street view is I'm like, dang, I know that image is like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from three years ago and I just wish it was updated. And that's the key is it's that real time crowdsourcing right. uh, you know, and, type and so, application. So the question that that we, can, we probably can't answer is how, quote, good is the LiDAR on today's iPhone right. versus the LiDAR that was on the first self-driving car? Yeah. Now, which one's better? I, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I and you're you're playing in a different. You're talking two different lidars. So the the if you look at the way the Apple is doing it, it's a solid state. So it's it's called flash lidar, right? So it's basically taking a picture and it's putting out x amount of points in that picture, mm -hmm. just one time, and then it comes back. They, it collects that data, right? Where when you look at these higher end lidar sensors that are on either mobile mappers or on UAVs or on manned planes, it's a continuous pulse. And so you're, you're talking uh, three to 500 points per square meter where this may only be 50. That's um, a function of power available, right? Yeah, and, and so that's what we're talking about is you're kind of playing, so the, the what was on this driverless car had that ability. I, I would almost go to, what if we look at the first lidar in history? Okay. Compared to what's on this iPhone, is what? How do those compare? Yeah, right. Because right. I'll, I'll guarantee they're probably pretty similar. Yeah. Um, in the ability, a um, lot smaller, right? right? But the actual data and the accuracy that's coming through, it's probably pretty similar. And so again, we're at the front end of this. What's it going to evolve to in five to six years? Yeah. So it's also a little bit scary, right? Because if once everybody has a lidar in their pocket. And, and or it's on every car or every street corner or every ring doorbell that's right. out there <laughs> or every camera um, has a camera and a LIDAR, you know, right above it, you know, suddenly, you know, it, look, I'll be dead by the time that happens. So you guys have to worry about it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I mean, you can just kind of think about the the scary scenarios where it's always what if it gets in the wrong hands. Somebody has an accurate representation of a street. You think of the the bombing that happened in Boston, and now you can go in, the, the wrong person can go in and say, I'm going to put a bomb here, I'm going to put a bomb here. It's going to have the biggest effect. Um, so definitely some things on the maybe the privacy side to think about yeah. there. Or, um, or manipulation of yeah. it. So back to your point, Tyler, where there's a crime scene, and you believe you have a... a actual depiction of, of what happened based upon all the sensors that might be around and somebody hacks into the system and changes it and suddenly it's you know dan who's the bad guy well i mean that's the biggest threat in today is cybersecurity, anyways right so that's a, a whole nother problem but I, you, you know i could i i, I kind of going off of yours the think of like the italian job or the oceans movies yeah yeah right yeah. italian job good movie uh, it's, it's one of the best Marky Mark movies that's out there, right? <laughs> yes. It made me want to get a, uh, what is it? the, the a, a mini? Mini, yeah. yeah a mini, mini Cooper. Cooper. <laughs> I, for years, I wanted a Mini Cooper. Yeah, so let's take a tangent. Did, did you ever go to King's Dominion? Yes. In King's Dominion, in the, back of the, in the back, they had a, a little roller coaster. It was called the Italian Job. And it was just, the cars were like little Mini Coopers. <laughs> yeah. And there was like a helicopter in it. It was kind of a cool little ride. Yeah. But if you think about it, right, uh, look at those movies. They, they kind of were looking towards the future because they always, they're always sitting in some cool five-star penthouse hotel room right. with TVs, and they have these virtual three-dimensional measurements. And, right. and so that's kind of what I think. I mean, um, ready to get a crew together. And yeah. Go rob, minis, a bank. go rob a bank. <laughs> Figure out which sewers I go can rob, through. Go rob Vegas, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, both of those good movies. You guys are dating yourself a little bit because they're kind of both old movies. They are old. I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we talked a lot about um, what we see for the future. Are there? Do you think there are any limitations that you want to talk about for carrying LiDAR in your pocket? Or well, I mean, there's limitations to LiDAR in general, right? Yeah. So um, there's, there's pluses and minuses. So one thing I wanted to hit on is why LiDAR over photos? Because... Right. A lot of people don't realize you can take a set of photos and as long as you have the, the right amount of photos and the proper overlap, you can turn a set of photos into a three-dimensional image um, by taking the pixels of each one of those and creating those, turning that pixel into a point. Right. And so you turn that pixel into a point and then you can create a point cloud. So the benefit of LiDAR 
traditionally in surveying and mapping over photos, because photos are a lot cheaper, right? And, uh, digital cameras cheaper than a LIDAR sensor right. typically. Right. Exactly. Aren't those called movies? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, the, the purpose where you'd use LIDAR over photos is LIDAR, at least the high-end lasers, they can penetrate canopy. So they're not actually shooting through, like if you think canopy has leaves, right? So if I got an area that has a bunch of trees and I'm trying to see what and measure the ground, um, a photo can't see underneath that canopy. But what LIDAR does, because it sends so many pulses of that laser, it finds every crook and cranny and crevice to find, um, to be able to hit the ground. Right, because so, right. it's not completely dark. Correct. There's always yeah, light that gets absolutely. through. Absolutely. So um, <clears throat> it's been traditionally used, uh, there, you can actually go online. The Phoenix system that we've uh, utilized here at Avian, um, they took that down to, I think it was Guatemala mm -hmm. and found some old ancient Mayan runes. There was a whole documentary on that. And uh, Megan Fox was even uh, a part of oh, that. Really? Yeah, she was <laughs> interviewing the, the Phoenix team. So, but the... So that's the benefit of LIDAR over photos. Right. But the problem with LIDAR is when you go into like rainy conditions, if it gets wet, right. it the it reflects. your reflects. reflection, yeah. and then you could have bad data, you could have corrupt data, you may not have accurate data. So that's one of the, the downfalls of it. But the, the plus side of it too is it works at night. Yeah. Photos don't. Yeah. So when you talk about crowdsourcing, you know, you're walking down whatever street in the middle of the night, it doesn't have that limitation. So cool. But I, I, I can't really think of a downside. Well, of... I think what you're, you're faced with at some point is physics, right? Because it comes down to power. How yep. much power do you have? How much power can you actually generate in your iPhone? Now, it's orders of magnitude better now than it was five years ago. And, you know, or it'll be orders of magnitude better five years from now. It's how much power can you generate to, to blast out that, that beam of light? Now, did it say, did it give a range? Did Apple put out a range? I didn't see. So that was the information that was hard to find. Yeah. Is the exact specifications of what their system could do. Um, so no, they didn't put out a range. I assume it's because they're the first and they don't want Samsung or yeah. some of those other brands coming along and say, I mean, they're going to do it anyways. But It wouldn't um, surprise me if it's only a couple meters in yeah. this first one because you talked about power, right? So what's powering yeah. it and... Um, I mean, just even on the traditional LiDAR scanners, um, your smaller scanners, you're looking at 50 meters to where the scanner we had, we could go to about 400 meters. Right. Um, and then your man scanners can do a, a thousand meters, right? But the the power output that's right. required and the, the type of scanner that's required to get that far distance. So we may not be at the point yet where, you know, it can see past that couple meter range, which will be beneficial in the future because then you can actually get buildings and stuff depicted in in um, that type of scenario and that crowdsourcing scenario. But right now it may be pretty limited to its actual output. And I think that's pretty common of seeing the power advancement needing to happen before other advancements can happen. So I think they're probably at their limitations for what their cameras and sensors can do. Um, what will be interesting is how quickly they can uh, advance their battery uh, technology so that right. they and, can have and, the power and, it needs. You know, I'm not smart enough to know where, where they are in that efficiency curve. Yeah. You know, for a lightweight battery that goes inside your phone and you start using your, your iPhone LiDAR, you know, if in 15 minutes your battery goes dead, nobody's going to be happy. Right. Yeah. yeah. Or if it starts blowing up like Samsung's. Or catching on fire. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, bad. That's probably bad for everyone. All right. I think... We had a pretty decent conversation about LiDAR. I think we hit a lot of really great points, had a, some really great ideas. It sounds like we might be contacting some police forces here in a little <laughs> while. Um, but I'd say this was a success for the first episode of the Space Shovel Podcast. Uh, thank you both for joining me. Thanks and for having me. Of yeah, course, thanks for having me. Dan, you're going to be the thanks constant for joining on the episode. Yeah. <laughs> so, All right, yeah, so I'll be the dude us. behind the red microphone. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. All right, cool. Yeah, thank you. And we'll see everybody next time.